On the 14th of May 2019, 52 soldiers of the Nigerian army were conducting a patrol near the village of Belaberi in western Niger, when suddenly they were ambushed by a large enemy force. For over two hours, the Nigerian troops fought hard to hold their positions, but in the end, they were forced to withdraw, having lost 28 men killed in action. The scale of the defeat at Belaberi ultimately led to the Nigerian government to request for external assistance in driving out the insurgent threat in the west of the country. And in late May of 2019, the governments of Mali, Niger and France, with support from Britain, America and the United Nations, agreed to conduct a joint counterinsurgency operation in a region that straddles the Malian-Nigerian border. A statement released by the French Ministry of Defence outlines that This major operation, codenamed Operation Akinit, was planned and carried out with very little notice, and is a response to the request of Nigerian President Mohamedou Issafou in response to the attacks carried out by armed groups against the Nigerian armed forces in Bella Berry. The French forces involved have deployed more than 400 men and nearly 100 vehicles from the Edelweiss Desert Tactical Group from the bases of Gao and Manaka in Mali. This joint operation, made up of intelligence, zone control and combat actions, constitutes the culmination of the operational military partnership implemented by the French armed forces. Getting underway on the 7th of June 2019, the first five days of Operation Akinit proceeded without incident, and it wasn't until the night of the 13th of June that the first major contact of enemy forces was made. On that day, a large group of insurgents were identified to be dug in in a woods on the Malian side of the border, leading to a force of 45 French commandos, supported by two Tiger and four Cayman helicopters, being dispatched with orders to clear the woodland. After a night of heavy fighting, the French commandos had, by morning of the 14th of June, made substantial progress in clearing their objective, with an estimated 26 insurgents being killed or wounded. Against the backdrop of this success, and as the sun began to break over the horizon, the decision was made to replace the two supporting Tiger helicopters with two gazelles, with the relief being completed by 0600. However, shortly after arriving over the area of operations, one of the gazelles came under heavy enemy fire and soon began to lose engine power, forcing the aircraft's pilots to level the helicopter out and brace for a crash landing. One of the pilots on board the gazelle at the time, who the French military have since identified as Kevin, later recounted, Right then, we are about to crash down, so we try following the procedure we learnt for when the engine is lost. We are at 120 to 130 km per hour. After crash landing, I went through the windscreen of the aircraft with my seat. The seat was completely ripped off, but I was still tied to it. I found myself with my legs still inside the cockpit, the rest of my body outside. Within seconds of the gazelle coming to a stop, the aircraft went up in a ball of flames, but despite the nature of the crash landing, all three of the helicopter's crewmen, including its two pilots and an onboard sniper, survived the impact although both pilots crawled out from the wreckage seriously wounded and unable to walk. Meanwhile, a radio message regarding the loss of the gazelle was sent out, and immediately the crew of one of the departing Tiger helicopters decided to return to the front line and rescue their three down colleagues, who were at risk of being captured or killed by the enemy. With complete disregard for their own safety, the two pilots of the Tiger helicopter flew into and made landfall just 30 metres from the crash site, from where they could see the three-man crew of the Gazelle making their way across open ground towards the landing zone. Being the one who was most fit of the three, the Gazelle sniper, known as Max, dragged one of the wounded pilots towards the Tiger and placed him behind the aircraft out of view of the enemy. Just moments before, he rushed back out into the open to help the second pilot, who, having lost feeling in both of his legs, was forced to roll on his side to get away from the burning Gazelle. With help from Max, he eventually made it to the landing zone, where he and the other pilot, despite their wounds, were hauled up onto the Tiger's landing gear and instructed to hold on. Max, in the meantime, positioned himself onto one of the stub wings of the helicopter and gripped onto a nearby handle. One of the pilots of the Tiger helicopter, who has since been identified as Nicholas, recalls, All three are on the aircraft, with only one secured thanks to a lifeline. The other two are hanging with only the strength in their arms and hands. This is what makes, I would say difficult, the following phase. One thinks that at any time they could lose their grip, either by fainting or because of me if I fly poorly. Being an attack helicopter, the Tiger was only designed to carry two crewmen, 
But yet, due to the quick thinking and resourcefulness of those present, the helicopter lifted off from the landing zone carrying five men, just six minutes after the gazelle had gone down. Flying out from the crash site, the Tiger returned to a French-controlled sector and touched down once more, thus enabling the sniper and the two wounded pilots to be transferred to a more suitable aircraft and evacuated to a nearby medical facility. 